It is my uh, pleasure to introduce Deborah. All of you know who she is at today. Um, I, I'm a fairly new member of uh, Temple Beth Am, but I met Deborah through some of the through uh, the library minion and also through sisterhood activities. And she and I sat down pre-COVID about um, 18 months to two years ago, and she told me the story of Carl Lemle. And it stood out to me. It was such an amazing story, and I and I didn't know anything about it. And so when I start, I started to look at Los Angeles very differently because I started to look at it through his eyes and started to notice the theaters and the landmark above Universal Studios that has his name. And it is a tremendously wonderful story. And Deborah is involved in a number of, number of uh, activities associated with this that she'll share with you, including education. But as an educator myself, I was fascinated by the story that unfolded over this ice cream that we actually had. We didn't have coffee, we ended up having ice cream. So tonight is a tremendous pleasure to introduce her. Um, and I'm just gonna read a few things, maybe just in case some of you didn't know this about Deborah, about her tremendous background. Um, she's been part of the Temple Beth Arm Library Minion community for 20 years. Her mother and stepfather, uh, Rabbi Susan Lemley and John Antignus, our longtime members. Her daughter Esther graduated from Preston in 2019, and her older, older daughter Rachel also attended Preston. Uh, Deborah is a historian, um, as uh, she studied history, art, and film at Brown University, and earned a bachelor's in English from UCLA, and then trained to be a teacher at the Waldorf Institute of Southern California all of which prepared her for researching her ancestors, her European roots, communicating her findings through stories, art and film. She's passionate about bringing history into the present so that it may be appreciated by this next generation, which is a tremendous uh, a, a driving force behind what she does with this passion. So as without an ado, I'd like to introduce Deborah and thank her um, for speaking tonight, and uh, we have a wonderful audience who are really interested in this story. So, Deborah, I'm now going to hand it over to you, and I'm going to let you take the lead. Thank you, Deborah. I'll unmute myself. There. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, okay, wait. I'm going to share my screen. Do I have to do something? What do I have to do to share my screen? This is my first Zoom talk, so be patient with me, please. Um, I need an advisor, like, yeah, okay. So okay, on the green, you see the green share button? Yes, we'll right. Uh -huh. There we go. Okay. So, uh, okay, hang on a second. I Okay, I'm going to start the slideshow, but it is here and from the beginning. Okay, there we go. So. I started Hollywood History Society when we were making our documentary um, because it was clear to me that it was going to be a nonprofit venture, really. And I wanted to um, have the mission be to not just um, tell this true story, but also other true stories about Jews in Hollywood. Um, and I thank Jerry Krautman also for helping me establish that. Um, and this is really how I'm related to Carl Lenly. He is in the middle here. Um, he was always the shortest one in the bunch. Um, and that is something I have in common with him, which is really interesting. Um, <laughs> and my, my grandfather, Kurt, here is um, on the right side. And this is my great-grandmother, Alice and her husband Siegfried Lemley. And I think these were two employees from Universal. Um, so my grandfather, Kurt, uh, growing up had a German accent and I was a little curious about that. And that is maybe what led me to start researching, but it was also just the fact of knowing that somebody like Carl Lemley was so famous, but I really didn't know anything about him. And I was very curious. So, um, so I started researching and I um, found this picture actually through Greg and 
and my cousin Greg who at the, from the Lemley Theaters because he he put this up in the Royal uh, in the lobby of the Royal Theater um, to show the connection with the family. Um, but I'm not going to go into that much about um, my immediate family. I did learn things researching for our documentary about my great grandparents, and that's in the documentary. So I don't really want to um, repeat things that are in the film because I want you to wait and see the film when it is ready, which hopefully will be by the summer. Um, so I wanted to talk about the roots of where Carl Lemley and my grandfather and, and, and the whole Lemley family came from, which was Baden-Württemberg and how Carl Lemley saved Jews from Baden-Württemberg. Um, so here is the, I'm just gonna minimize, let's see here, this. Here is the, the, um, the, region of Baden-Württemberg. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's this is the province um, in Germany and it borders on Austria and Switzerland. It's, it's in the southwest part. And here's a close-up and it's got, um, it's quite mountainous, but, um, and, you know, bordering on Switzerland. And here's Freiburg. There's Ulm. These are, and Tübingen, Stuttgart is the capital. Um, and at the time when the really the height of the Jewish population in the 1800s and 1900s, um, there was a lot of little towns scattered all around Baden-Württemberg where Jews lived. And it was really striking to me when we went there um, to see the remains of a lot of the towns. And uh, I wanted to know more at that time about really the whole community that had existed there because it was very it was very interesting um so i found this map doing research now and it's really um it's this is actually the cemeteries because it's very interesting these earliest jewish communities were from the middle ages and they the towns grew substantially after the jewish emancipation in 1828 but um, they share, different towns shared cemeteries, and you can see all these little cemeteries around, and that's just an indication there were actually many more towns even. There were about 140 towns all throughout Baden-Württemberg um, that had Jews living in them. And um, so in the 1900s, the pop, Jewish populations in the cities grew due to industrialization and the cities um, were allowing Jews in then. And so some of the, 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 also Jews were going into the universities, getting higher education, being admitted into the universities in Freiburg and Heidelberg, Tübingen and Stuttgart. And, but by 1933, there was a total of approximately 23,000 Jews living in Baden-Württemberg. And I just, <laughs> I'm laughing because I was really curious to know that number and it wasn't easy to find it. In fact, I found a website that just had all the different towns and um, what the population in each town was. So I went through and added them up to get this number. So, um, but it, it's kind of, it, it's, it's a whole study in itself really to figure out how the Jewish population changed and everything. But. Um, but still, as we know, now there's really only Jews that have returned uh, since after the war, and most of them are from Eastern Europe or Russia. So, so all these communities were wiped out in the Holocaust. About half the people were deported, and maybe the other half um, managed to emigrate or escape. But it's really difficult to do to find out exactly. Um, um, so this is a rough idea just to give you an idea. Um, and also, I, I just want to say at the end, you might have questions, but you might also, uh, I hope it inspires you to do research also about your own family if you haven't already, because it's very, it's very rewarding. Um, but, but this story of Carl Lemley, okay, he was born in Laupheim. That was amazingly enough um, wait, let me go back here. I just want to show you on this map, if you can see Laupheim is here. Can you see this cursor? 
Yes? I don't know. I don't know. I can't see anybody. Yes? You're nodding? Okay. So Laupime is here. That's where Carl Lemley came from and all the Lemleys. And here um, there's also, but that was not really, it's not really a major city now, but at the time Laupime and this other town of Bad Buchau, which is over here, were the two largest communities, uh, Jewish communities in Württemberg. And really Württemberg was a separate um, kingdom and Baden was separate and it was only made into one state after World War II. So it's kind of, uh, the histories are, are a little bit different. So I'm really just focusing on Württemberg, but, um, but some of the people Carl saved were from Bad areas in Baden too. So it's, you know, can't get. Um, so Laupheim here and Bad Bucha, um, we filmed and we were there and those are the two happen to be the towns that had the largest Jewish populations in the 1800s. And they did not, um, they did not, you know, maintain their Jewish populations after World War II at all. Um, but there are memorials and uh, things like that, and museums and in each town. So it's very interesting to go to them now too. So oh, this house, is where Carl Lemley was born in Laufheim. And it's actually still there. That building is still there. And Carl's father, Julius, built the house in 1860, which is really interesting because I learned talking to the um, director of the museum there. There's a very interesting museum in Laufheim called the History of Christians and Jews in Laufheim. That is the, what the museum is called. And it really chronicles how the the two cultures were very intertwined because Jews made up a large part of the town and were actually very successful. And so um, this is actually a pet peeve of mine sort of with some of the theorists about Hollywood history is that they say, um, especially, you know, I don't wanna name names, but somebody who's really famous, who, who wrote a great book about <laughs> the moguls and the history of the Jewish moguls said, that had a theory that tied everything together. Supposedly, all the Jewish moguls had very, um, um, you know, dysfunctional childhoods, and that's what drove them to America to start studios. But um, what I found when I researched Carl Emily is that he did not come from a dysfunctional family. He went to America to seek his fortune, but um, his his family was not super wealthy. Uh, they did not own the castle in Laupheim, which another Jewish family actually did own the castle um, and had a hops factory, which made hops for beer. And they, that was the Steiner family. And they had, um, they were the largest employer in Laupheim. But Julius, Julius, Carl's father was a peddler and he also sold real estate or dabbled in real estate. It's a little, uh, so, so he built this house, which I, I only learned recently, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, and it was one of the largest houses in Laupheim. And so the Jews by 1828 there were completely emancipated. They were not uh, protected citizens anymore. They were um, allowed to, uh, they were not protected, they were citizens. Because before that, in the 1700s, there was a treaty where they allow they allowed the Jews into the city, but they were they had to pay a protection tax um, to the local authorities, and they were not completely free, and they had to leave, live in certain areas, and they were only then allowed to trade in cattle or horses or um, leather goods or and other goods. So that's why they were peddlers, and quite a few were cattle. Uh, traders. So after 1828, there was um, the law of emancipation and the Jews were allowed to farm and also take up crafts. And right, previously they were only allowed to sell cattle, horses, or goods. Um, one thing I learned that's really interesting about the Jewish community in these towns is that I was looking through every town, it said, okay, there was a rabbi or they shared the rabbi with the other town. And then there was a religious school teacher. And a lot of times the religious school teacher 
also was the chazan and also was the shochet, was the butcher. And it seems a little funny to us, I think, nowadays that somebody who was a teacher would also be uh, the, the butcher. But I was thinking maybe that was possible because so many had uh, been involved in cattle trading also something. I don't, I don't know. In any event, it's just kind of an interesting thing to learn more about later. But um, so these are Carl's parents, uh, Julius Baruch Lemley and Rebecca Lemley. And this is the only known picture of them. It was um, published in a biography of Carl Lemley. And um, I, I just think it's it's pretty interesting picture. Um, his mother was a homemaker, but very industrious and actually found a internship for Carl Lemley in a nearby uh, town in Bavaria of Ichenhausen where he was an apprentice to a stationer and he learned English and he learned how to write letters. And after that, he left for America. And his father apparently uh, was actually a respected um, person in the Jewish community and people would come to him to ask advice. And so um, after Carl's mother died, that's when he left for America. He was 17 and he had $50. And so he was born, Carl was born in 1867. He emigrated 1884, founded Universal 1914. And then he sold it in 1936. Of course, I'm really rushing through this because the main purpose of the talk isn't to talk about his uh, success at Universal or, and also um, that has been written about quite a bit already. Um, I mean, it's very exciting and interesting, but um, really between 1936 and 39 is when he spent 80% of his time helping Jews escape Baden-Württemberg. And that was, he was retired and he had the um, wealth to sponsor people and also the political connections um, that he could write letters to convince people to honor his affidavits. So it is said that he saved um, three or 400 people, but no list exists um, probably because he was eventually banned by the state department and they refused to honor any more affidavits. And before that, he did not want anybody really to know how many people he was saving because um, that would only make it less likely, you know, if, if they saw how many. So he kind of downplayed the numbers, I think. And But he did promise to help a lot of people. And those that he couldn't help himself, he wrote to other people and asked them to sponsor. Um, so that was something that is, is really poignant um, to, to read about. Um, here, Sandy Einstein is in our film. He's, his father, Herman, was one of the people who was rescued by Carl. And Herman was a cantor and a Hebrew teacher in the town of Buchau. And he met Carl Lemley in 1929 uh, at a party for the Graf Zeppelin, which had flown around uh, the world at that time. And then they had a party in Frederick Schaffen for, for the Graf Zeppelin. And that's where he met Carl. And then in 1937, Carl uh, convinced him to come to America with him. And we talk more about that in the film too. And um, this is Herman with one of his students in Germany, either, I'm not sure if this is Laupheim or Buchau, this town, but he taught in both places. He taught at this Jewish school in Laupheim. And after he came to America, he um, didn't work as a Hebrew teacher anymore, but Sandy talks about that in the film. And the way Sandy found out even that his father had been saved by Carl, because it's really a big mystery to unravel, um, is through this man, uh, Udo Bear, who was from Laupheim and was a teacher and, and a film scholar living in Laupheim who really took it upon himself to become an expert in Carl Lemley and then had one of his former students who was in the United States in Washington, DC, he asked her to do research at the National Archives and 
locate whatever she could about the affidavits. And that was, and then he published it in this essay called Lemley's List in uh, Film History Magazine. <laughs> and that was how, uh, that was really the first person to ever write about this topic. So we're all indebted to Udo and sadly he passed away in, um, in 1998. And in fact, he was actually friends with the, um, the head of the, the UCLA television and film archives. And uh, his wife, um, Gabby Bear, still is continuing his work by um, writing and giving talks in Germany and in Laupheim and organizing things to honor Carl Lemley there. Uh, so this is copy of a letter um, with the Nazi seal that was written from a school where Sandy's father taught um, and they, they had to explain various things to him like how uh, they couldn't reassure assure him a job at that point or different different you, you can see the progression of of um, restrictions when you read the letters that Sandy has. Um, so one of the people Carl wrote to to get his affidavits honored is Congressman John Duckweiler of California, who was the congressman from 1933 to January 1939. And so I just put a picture of the Sacramento Capitol from that time to go with it because I thought it was kind of interesting. And um, this is a copy of a letter that we have from the National Archives that Carl wrote to Congressman Dockweiler. And it's really poignant if you hear Carl's writing. Uh, I, I, I always enjoyed reading his letters when I was doing research. Uh, and, and I just, there's something about the style he learned to write letters that it, it was very effective. Like he starts out and he says, I want to ask a big favor of you. You know, I'm bringing over quite a number of Jewish people from Germany. And um, I need not tell you what these poor people are up against, as I'm sure you are thoroughly posted. I've gone the limits in bringing them over and have furnished perhaps a hundred or more affidavits in the past two years. I find that U.S. Consul General Samuel Honecker in Stuttgart, Germany is making it harder and harder for me to get my visas for my people. He takes the position that I am 71 years old and that my guarantee of support is not of great value owing to my age. I, on the other hand, take the position that my children are responsible for my affidavits in case something should happen to me. I have devoted a great deal of time to corresponding with Consul General Honecker, and while I have been successful in a good many instances, it takes so much energy away. <laughs> anyway, he just, I just think he's very uh, diplomatic in the way he writes. And, and it obviously was pretty effective um, because he did manage to get the affidavits honored and it, was, it wasn't easy because um, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the State Department then. As as uh, now, this is the list that was put together for an exhibit at the House of Geschichte Baden-Württemberg, the Museum of History in Baden-Württemberg, with of the exhibit Carl Lemley presents that we went to in December 2016. And this is Sandy with us, and here's uh, Warren and Esther and me at the it, at the the poster in the lobby of the exhibit and. This is uh, a list of all the people. They had uh, some names on the wall. I mean, it really, Carl Emily was really honored a lot more in Germany than he actually is here, in fact. I mean, so, so that's one of the things I'm trying to maybe remedy in, in my small way here. So um, this is an additional list that I put together from other research I was doing some, some was also featured in that exhibit, but I kept finding more and more information when I, in fact, this person right here, Rudy Bergman, I just read about because he's a screenwriter and he wrote an article recently um, chronicling um, that his father had um, 
actually Rudy is the father and the son um, was a screenwriter and he, he wrote uh, the article in commentary about, about his father Rudy being saved by Carl Lemley. So it's just incredible how people are coming out of the woodwork and the people I put stars by are the people who are in our film. This Schloss family, uh, actually we interviewed Lou's daughter, Karen, and his widow, he had just passed away, but we interviewed his widow, Muriel. And um, also the Bender family, we interviewed Fred Bender um, about, a year or two before he passed away. And that's, he's in the film too, which is, is really amazing. So um, this, is, this is what we did. We, we, basic, we, we focused on three of the families in our film, the Bender family, the Schloss family, and the Einstein family. And there's, there's really a story for each, each family, if you can really find the story, um, and it's very interesting but we, no, nobody knew where the people was. So it was kind of by, by coincidence. Okay, sorry, wait, wait. Uh, uh. Okay, wait, how can I get out of this now? I have to stop the screen, stop share. Okay, okay. So now, I mean, maybe um, I, my last thing I wanted to do was also to share a little one and a half minute video, okay? Um, oh, wait, Irene Dorf, I'm saying, I know the Obenar family in New York. Oh, how amazing. This is amazing. Okay. Um, you wanna allow a few people to, to ask questions for a second, Jane? Yes. And then, because then I have just a minute and a half um, video uh, that I put together of some uh, vintage footage that I wanted to show. Um, why don't we, if, if you have questions, if everybody, if you have questions for Deborah, why don't you put them in the chat box and you can, uh, she can access the chat book, box and, and answer them. Deborah, could you turn your, oh, you. Wait, no. I can't hear you, Jerry, you're muted. Did you I was going to tell you it's just your video, but you just did, so now you're fine. Oh, I actually didn't do anything, but okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, I, I'm just going to play this one and a half minute thing to end it off, yeah. which is a, um, oh, I have to share the screen again. Okay, one second. Okay. Um, okay, share the screen. And where's the... Wait a second, here. Okay, I think this is gonna work, hang on. Okay. Um, in 1925, Carl Lemley made a little silent film that's 15 minutes long in Laupheim and it's really adorable. Um, so I just edited it down to a minute and a half and it just shows uh, some of the Jewish parts of the town and a few of a few of the Jewish families.
All right, uh, uh, Jerry, why don't you unmute everybody now? Thank you, Deborah. I think it's worth now actually uh, seeing what kinds of questions that people have about uh, Carl Lemle. Um, I just want to make, I think you, it would be better if people asked you these questions directly. Uh, so I'm just trying to see if we could, can we unmute everyone, Jerry? You're muted yourself, Jerry. They can write questions or they can raise their hands, I guess, or. I, yeah, or put the questions in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on the chat box. So if you want to, we can also do that. We can do that. Okay, well. Um, What's that? Oh, that's too much. Oh, now I lost it. Well, the oh. open um, the open hour family um, is in New York. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So, is there mm -hmm. a question? Um, I don't have a question, but I have a, a comment. We yeah. were Greg and I were very blessed to have gotten to go to Laupheim ourselves and see the same exhibit that you saw at Stuttgart. Um, when we were at the cemetery in Laupheim, we not only saw Lemley's, we also saw part of Albert Einstein's family. And on one of the headstones, it said, um, Sophie Einstein Lemley. And that's when we realized that we are all related to Albert Einstein. Wow. <laughs> The, the Einsteins also had were mostly in um, Buchau. I that's what I learned because San, Sandy's family came from Buchau. But there was obviously yes, I saw that in our tree too. That there is there was somebody in our tree who married an Einstein. Yes, so yeah, it's it's they, the, there were certain families like not that many different Jewish families. And I guess they all kind of mix together. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Um, there's a question on the, on the chat box, uh, which is how did you get the old films converted to digital format? It's, it's from AJ. Was that already done or did you find old film strips that had, been, that were, that had to be converted? Um, well, this particular film was, already converted and it was in the property of the museum in Laupheim and then that was shared already digitally with me mm -hmm. actually via Sandy but in any event yes so that one I did not convert it was already digital but I did find other films um, that my grandfather had shot that I had converted myself by somebody I know somebody actually here who has a company that does an excellent job of doing that. Very, not, you know, fairly reasonably, <laughs> but yeah. So you can have it done. If you have old films that are deteriorating, I would uh, advise you to have them converted if you can. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a comment about um, Albert Einstein was actually born in Ulm. In fact, if you can switch on the chat box, can you- Oh, I can see it. Yeah, Albert Einstein was born in Ulm. That's correct. He was, his parents lived in Buchau. We went, we saw the building where his parents had been living. And it's actually in our film too. There was so much that I could include, you know, it's, it's there's a lot of information. So I couldn't put too much detail, but yes, his, he was a second cousin to Sandy who, who I showed a picture of. Um, but Sandy always kind of downplays that relationship, but yeah, they, there, there were many Einsteins, so apparently 99 Einsteins buried in, in, uh, in Buchau. So yes, Albert Einstein was born in Ulm and I guess he grew up there. His parent, he was conceived in Buchau. That's what they tell you if you go to Buchau. <laughs> so um, <laughs> in addition to Carl Lemley, another famous person, that's true. Okay, now I don't need to read the chat, but I can. Deborah, what was Carl's relationship to, wait, what, now it moved. What was Carl's relationship with the people he saved? Did he know them? How were they chosen? That is a very good question. Um, it's really different in each case. Sandy, who I showed a picture of, he, his father had a special friendship with Carl, but that was actually, that was sort of unusual. Um, 
The other family, the Benders that we met, um, actually the grandmother was adopted into the Lemley family. Um, so that was how he knew that family. But uh, the other family, the Schlosses, I'm, we are not really sure. I, they just wrote to him. He received hundreds and hundreds of letters and he picked out, I suppose, if he knew somebody and had a connection or sometimes not, it was, it's hard to, you know, every case was different, I guess, but he did feel very attached to this part of uh, that he came from this area. And so he knew a lot of people because he actually went back every year to visit. So he knew a lot of the families still. And before he started issuing affidavits for people he was not related to, he really took care of all of the family members he had that were willing to leave too. So um, Jews from Laupheim include Ger Gretel Bergman, right, the athlete who prevented from participating. Why doesn't people just t say these things? Because okay. I'm well, I, I, why don't I read through I some of to, I don't have to. It's more interesting if they, if people contribute, I think, okay. now. Well, let me ask you a couple of the questions that, that you maybe haven't seen and then other people. Okay, okay. Um, the question, there's a question about the synagogue in Lauf, is it Laufheim? Um, Laufheim. No, Laufheim. 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 Is it still around? Is it, is, is it still around? Um, Tish is, is nodding, but I, I don't think that the synagogue in Laupheim is still there. No, um, no, it was, <laughs> it was, there was a, um, a church built on that site or, or something that it was already destroyed. In most of the places, the synagogues were destroyed on Kristallnacht. Um, this, in Laupheim, what is still there that is historical is really the cemetery is very historical. And also, there's this Red Oxen Inn where people can stay now and where Carl Lemley stayed before. And it's very beautiful and interesting little inn. And that was where the Jews hung out. It, it, it was in the silent film when the old people were sitting in front. That was in front of the Red Oxen. That's, um, that's still there. So most of the towns, but there, there are a few places where the synagogue survived in Baden-Württemberg, but not in Laupheim. So at that point, they just built something else over, over it. But we, you saw it in the film. You saw the old picture in the yeah. film of it. Deborah, your yes. screen is not showing. Could you turn it on or off or whatever? Because I'm trying to spotlight you and we can't see. Um, turn it on and off my screen? Yeah. Um, how sh should just leave, leave the chat and come back? No, or just stop the video. Questions from the chat, Deborah. OK, there. OK. Good? Yeah. Better? Better? Can you see can you see Deborah? Oh, now it says that's I can't see you, Deborah. Screen, Deborah. Well, I see a black screen. Now I see it. That's weird. Maybe the I wonder what's going on with the Is there light on you? Do you have enough light on you? Yeah, you I, can, I can view, I can top, see. you should be able to see everybody. Gallery view top right. Yeah, I can see myself here. I can see everybody now. But I can it, see everybody and I can see myself here. Can you see me here? Oh, I yeah. can't. Deborah, you may have to stop sharing your screen. It may be that you're seeing the black screen because it's assuming that you're still sharing your screen. Oh, well, I don't think so, but it says, um, no, okay. I don't know. No, I don't think so, but is it? Why don't I just leave and come back in or something? Uh, no. Well, I suppose, yeah. We've momentarily lost our speaker who will be coming back. Uh, momentarily, then hopefully we'll see. Coming back. And she's back. Good. Hi, Deborah. You there? There she is. Great. 
She's yes. muted. Perfect. Perfect. We got gotcha. you. Yeah. I think it was still sharing from the film. I'm sorry about that. Um, as a question from Carl Sunshine, he said, did Carl, uh, did Carl do his work getting people out from the USA or did he go back? Oh, that's very interesting too. He did not go back after 1930. He never went back to Germany. Everything was done from the United States. And he had a secretary uh, meet everybody who arrived at the dock and take them to an apartment. I mean, I didn't get into how much he did for people when they arrived here but he provided furnished apartments for people if they needed it. And apparently, according to my grandmother, he boasted that he never spent any money on people here because he just helped them get jobs and support themselves in the United States. But, um, but he did give them furnished apartments and he was very helpful with getting people jobs too. Got it. I've just asked everybody to unmute themselves and hopefully you, you have to do it yourself. You can, it looks as if everybody's done that now. That's great. Um, I, I, somebody, uh, Glenn Lambert said he was told that in Lofheim that the synagogue burned on Crystal Night and a church was built over the ruins. I think maybe right. you mentioned that already. Yes, right. And then Mar Levine said, Levin says, what percentage of the population were Jews? Oh, in Laupine, every, every town was a little bit different, you know. Um, I think in the university cities like La, uh, Heidelberg, and there were places that didn't allow Jews in, uh, you know, up until a certain point. But I think in Laupine, it was about 40%, or it was quite large. At, 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 in the peak of the 1800s, it's, it's interesting. Um, the, the, um, in Laupheim, in 1856, there were 843 Jews, and in Buchau, around the same time, there was about 828 Jews. So, you know, and, and, um, and then this, the Stuttgart, uh, the cities of Stuttgart and Freiburg and started growing in the 1900s, Jews started leaving the towns and going to the cities a little more, but there still remained all those communities. So most of them were there, the peak populations for most of them were in the 1800s. Um, I had a question and my question was, he say, it's just really a, a, just a mind boggling math question. He say 400 to 500 people. If you think of the multiples of generations that have gone after that time, I wonder, if you put in all of those individuals, what the figure or what the figure would be of the basically the, the generational life that he saved. Well, have... it, it is it is a lot and it's amazing. Um, but even somebody like Sandy, who wanted to be here, but I, he wasn't feeling well, so he couldn't join tonight, I don't think but um, he never he didn't have kids but um, you know, he contributed a huge amount to, to American culture yeah. because he was a manager for rock bands. In fact, he was a manager for the rock band uh, journey. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, it's all, it's the generations. Yes, because, and it's the potential okay. for what anybody could do mm -hmm. and what they could uh, help other people do. Yes. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah, one one man's work, and and the inheritance generation by generation is just incredible. It's just mind boggling. It's such an amazing. Right. Yeah. 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 Is somebody saying okay. something else? Uh, somebody else got a. Is there another question coming in? Um, Deborah, I thought I might add in response to the question about the synagogue okay. that when we were in went to Germany for my seventy fifth birthday and went there, it was the year before you and Warren went, I think. We went to Ickenhausen, which is where Carl Emily had his internship. Right. It was turned into a Jewish museum. That's right. wonderful. And we were quite right. hard, very beautifully put together with a mikveh. Right. Contained with oh, that wasn't in Ickenhausen. Oh, Ickenhausen. Oh, it right. is. We have that, we filmed there. We went there. It's very beautiful, and it's a it's a beautiful synagogue that was restored. And yeah. also, I wanted to just um, add 
that I would encourage people, it's a trip worth taking. That part of the uh, part of Germany, because even though there aren't, you know, so many Jews living there, these some of these sites are still there, and uh, it's really you can really put together a nice trip. So if anybody wants to make a trip, kind of retracing that, I'm sure that Deborah and I and you know would be happy to help you, kind of think through what you want to do. Ready for sharing your screen with us? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me. It's lovely. Us. Hold on, hold on. I don't know how to do that. There was, a, um, Freddie shared an, in, an interesting point, uh, Deborah, right. which I've only just started oh. to about myself. But there is another side of the story in the build up to World War II in LA. Lemley and the other Jewish studio heads were targeted by the local Nazi organization. And they worked with those in the Jewish community who were gathering ev evidence about these Nazi efforts. Um, the book Hitler in Los Angeles tells this story. Oh, right. yeah. I haven't read that, but that's actually something I'd like to know more. There was recently a television interview that highlighted the of, of the Nazis in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, so I Carl, Carl, Lem Carl actually. Um, um, he hired somebody to just do research for him and tell him about the news, basically, <laughs> and tried to ask anybody who came back what was happening. And he was a big supporter of B'nai B'rith and those newsletters, which were very helpful also in, in providing information. I mean, basically, I don't know what's going on with this screen, but I'll just keep talking. I think Freddie, Freddie, are you sharing your screen or something? It says you're viewing Freddie Rembaum's screen. So, uh, Freddie? It, it's anyway. fine. We can, as long as we can see you. Um, yeah, I don't know what she's doing. It's funny. That's the most important. Okay. That's a little Hi, Um uh, <laughs> There are many Bergmans on their call, on this call, including Rudy's daughter, Dorothy. Is Rudy's daughter, Dorothy, here on this um, call? Doris, I think she left. She was on it. Is she a member of Beth Am? No, she lives in New York. Oh, how did she even find out about this? This is amazing. Elizabeth Slaughterwitz. I'm Glenn Lambert. I'm uh, Margaret. Are you, are you, where are you? I am uh, I should be on your, your screen. I'm, um, I'm going to go to the gallery view. Sorry. Um, where are you? Waving. Waving. Um, there. OK, yes. Okay, hi. Um, hi. I'm, uh, I'm Gretel, Gretel Bergman's uh, son. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, Doris is my, my cousin. She's Rudy Bergman's daughter. Right. Um, and uh, yeah. Ru Rudy and Gretel were brother and sister. Um, yeah. Now, I, I, I went to Laupine with my mom in 1999. Um, so, yeah, we saw a lot of, of what, what you're talking about and the museum, which is wonderful. And my mom had personal uh, reminiscences of Carl Lemla coming back to town she said that he would he would show up when sh she was young, as you said, it was before 1930, and um, they would give him a parade. He would ride down the street in an open car and wave to everybody like a returning hero, and uh, he he gave gifts to the kids. And my mom remembered him walking around with her, you know, holding her hand um, and taking her around Laupine. When was this again? In this would have been prior to 1930. My mom was born in 1914. Right. Right. So I, I would right. think it was somewhere in the early 20s, right. probably. Well, that's amazing. That's a great story. I would definitely, I'd like to talk to you more about oh, this. Sure. And, um, Andrew is wrote the article, right? Right. <laughs> Andrew, yeah. Andrew is, is Doris's brother and, and my cousin. Right. And I would also like to talk to him because it was, it was really interesting beautiful article I, I gave both andrew and doris a, a last second um heads up about this because elizabeth zlotowicz told me i told them and doris was able to get on in time oh, right that's wonderful so, yeah. i'll jump in because here's the six degrees of separation right. so um dear debbie bender richards right is is a friend of mine Right. And we, we attend uh, the same synagogue. Right. So about an hour 
before the program, Debbie let me know about it. And then I let my cousins know. So there are about <laughs> six or eight, eight of my cousins that jumped on your program tonight. Thanks to Debbie Richards. All of them are on the East Coast and probably five, you know, it's very late. I, I, hope, I, I mean, I, I hope that, but, you know, it meets with your approval, everything. I mean, I, I always feel like my- we research, know, you know, Yeah, we know a lot. And my 99 year old mother who is incredibly sharp and has family trees and knows the Laupine Cemetery well and everything that you've talked about, I'm gonna, I'd like to put you in touch with her because I think she might, she's a Laupine connection. Okay, I, I'll just put, I put my email because I, the yeah, notice you. had the website for the Hollywood History Society, but um, I'll just put my email here and then please, please email me after because um, then, you know, we can really follow up with everything. And okay. forgive me, for I have a quick question because it was your introduction was so brief in, in the very beginning. Did do you say your mom is the rabbi? Um, my mother is is here joining us too. Yes, Rabbi Susan Lemley. Uh, okay. She's waving her hand there. Okay, because she and I met many 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 years ago. Wait, I I missed something on my email. I think that, you and, and we've met a couple of times actually. So there's a lot, a lot of small world. Through Rosemary, were you at you know Rosemary Hill, too? Um, no. no. Oh, okay. I, I thought you were. I. We can okay. talk, you know we're that's all. Mishpuch. We'll do the six degree. The Jewish they call it Jewish geography. It's all right? but anyway, okay. Here, Deborah Blum, F. Blum, dot F. Dot Blum, Gmail. Please email me and, and we can follow up because this is how it all happens, this kind of research. It's very bizarre, but it just happens through these bizarre coincidences and just talking to people. So you never know what, what's going to happen when you just talk to people. <laughs> if, you have, if you have a curious mind and you want to find things out. Um, so, so, so it's wonderful that everybody joined us. I mean, if, if, Anybody has any other questions um, or comments or anything? Please. Yeah, but if you if you were to give people advice, if it's somebody on somebody on this um, on this screen tonight was thinking, you know what, I really want to research somebody in my family. What advice would you give to them? Oh well, look, you know who I see here, Danny. Are you there? Is that Danny? I see a face down there, a little rice balm face. <laughs> It's so great to see you. See, it's great to see you're, you're back from your college and all of that and graduate school, <laughs> and, right? Okay, so if I wanted to give re, uh, advice to somebody about doing research, what would advice would I give? Is that the question, Jane? Yes. I mean, I, it's what I just said in a way is like, if you, if you have the curiosity and you talk to people, I mean, really, I just started talking to everybody in my family and then all these strange things started happening. Seriously, like, I mean, Greg was very kind. He just sent me the biography of Carl Lemley that was out of print, but it just arrived at my doorstep, I, you know, from Greg, which was really nice. And then, but, but in terms of talking to people like Debbie Bender, who is on this call, who told, you know, hi, Debbie. Okay, so we interviewed her father. His fa his He and his brother and his parents were saved by Carl. And the way we found Fred Bender, I had heard about him, but then I lost touch with him because he moved into an assisted living facility and I couldn't reach him. Um, then all out of the blue, I get an email from my cousin who, Leela, that her friend who was a teacher for LA Unified met Fred's niece and they were talking because they both taught at the same school. Somehow the thing of saving Jews came up and she mentioned that she was uh, related to somebody Carl Emily had saved. And then the friend said, oh, I, heard, I, I mean, I can't even believe that, that that's what happened, but it did. So um, I think it's like you put these feelers out and you just kind of, 
Yeah. Uh, and, and also when you're reading documents, I think one thing I learned um, actually at Brown in a really great history class is to read between the lines when you're reading letters and documents and to put the pieces together in your mind, like you, you're, you're not gonna have it all spelled out. You're never gonna find it spelled out. You have to make, make the story uh, work with your, like, like I wanted the number of Jews living in baden Württemberg, and I couldn't find that number. So I just took every single town and, and added it up, <laughs> you know? So you have to just kind of go where, where your um, curiosity takes you and use your wits and your brain. And it's like being a detective a little bit, I guess, but in the real world, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Deborah, Deborah, what can you tell us about the documentary? Uh, well, I can say it's it's um, interesting. It's creative. It's got uh, we're featuring the three families I talked about, and and um, also the the locations in Germany they came from. And we really look forward to everybody seeing it when it's available, hopefully by the summer. And hopefully uh, we can actually see it together in a theater. That would be amazing. So we'll, we'll just see how things go with that. But we really look forward to sharing it more with people. And at least, you know, at some point we'll have that ready to share. Okay. Well, I, 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 is it, does anyone else have any other questions tonight? If so, um, uh, just, just a really simple question is how old was Carl when he came to the United States? I missed he, he was 17 years old. Yeah, he, he had, but in, in, in that he was, uh, he had done a three year apprenticeship in letter writing and being a selling stationery. And then uh, basically the children in that family had to go out and seek their fortune at a certain time. His older brother Siegfried um, was already had his made his own business selling wines and he was a traveling salesman of wines and then he later started an antique store in munich but basically carl okay so carl's oldest brother joseph was already in america at the time but he didn't know where he was he'd lost touch with him but he had a, last heard he was in chicago so carl just you know, he went to America with $50, but he was very, um, I think he was very intrigued by America because the story goes that he read uh, dime novels, uh, which were adventures of the Native Americans and the right. cowboys. And he was very intrigued with the whole Wild West uh, thing. So so he just got on a boat and then struggled basically for about 20 years as a bookkeeper. And I mean, there's, it's a whole story how he got into film. I mean, that's, and, and we do put a little bit of that in the, in our documentary, we kind of have a brief fun overview of how he became successful too, which is. Um, there's a question, uh, Deborah, is there a mailing list that people can join in order to receive future notifications about the documentary? Um, Yes, I think the best thing right now is if you go to Hollywood History, okay, dot org, and then you can, here it is, you can join the mailing list there. The, if you want to read about the film, there's a link on there to threepalmtrees.com, and that's the production company that's making the film. And you can also sign up there. I'll get your email wherever it goes. I'll get your email or okay. you can email me because right now it's kind of a small operation, but <laughs> hopefully, but I, I will keep you posted and I am keeping a mailing list for sure. So I definitely look forward to accumulating, um, letting everybody know about what's happening. And Deborah, I want to thank you so much. I, I really respect all the work you did and really enjoyed watching well, it. I'm looking forward to seeing the film. Thank yeah. you. I'm really glad you were able to join Gloria Ruth. This was really nice. So if, um, if, if there are no other, anybody else have any questions? I thought maybe we'll, we'll wrap up. 
um, I, I, I like everyone else, really looking forward to this documentary. Um, I, I think there's a message in in what he did that can be used in education for the next generation or two as well. It's a very strong message, and I hope that I hope that we're able, that you're able to get that out as well. Um, are you there, Adep? Are you there, Deborah? Yeah, I am. I know Warren has my picture on yeah, his iPad. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to say something. I'm can the I, one who registered can, can you, Zoom on his iPad, but can it's you kind hear of me? Yes. Somebody is trying to see you. Uh, yeah. I, you, I, here I am. There, Warren. Yay! Me? There's the editor uh, of the film. Yeah. And the composer. Uh, it's so amazing to see everybody and, and to see, uh, you know, uh, Susan Kfelling as she's uh, watching uh, Deborah speak and, and I'm Kfelling and, and uh, Deborah really uh, cre is creating something that is, uh, you know, is going to last and, and uh, really entertain and educate and inspire people. So, and I'm very proud to be able and honored to be able to work with her on this. Oh. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for <laughs> giving me my space in the other room yeah. while I get to talk. No. <laughs> okay. This is great. Yeah. Thank you, Warren. That's very sweet. And um, wonderful. You, yep. I just had, a, it just came to me. Are there German subtitles or German dubbing? Oh yeah, yeah, we need your help. We need your help. <laughs> I a, was just thinking this could be also very, very interesting yeah. for the people in Germany who helped or who, you know. No, we are definitely, I, I'm just gonna answer that. Um, we are definitely gonna have the movie uh, playing in Germany. We're gonna add subtitles. In fact, I recently had a conversation with the director of the museum in Laupheim to just talk about some more of the research. And um, I'm very excited. That's really why I want it to, I want it to be shown also as a nonprofit in museums and, and definitely in Germany, definitely. I didn't mention, but I was born in Freiburg, which is another bizarre coincidence. And I think it's one reason I had to really do all of this research too in some way so i'm very connected and 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 people are really interested there uh you were born in germany yeah it's kind of a yeah <laughs> we never knew that That's we never knew that grisha and i never knew that really? my my father was getting his advanced law degree at the university of freiburg in 1964 and and then i uh apparently I think he was deciding between maybe one other place in Europe and then I think the fact that my grandfather was from Stuttgart and he encouraged my parents to go there. So that's where I was born. I don't remember. I was only seven months old when they came back, but it's a beautiful city. It's it, That's a very medieval, beautiful uh, by the Black Forest. And um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, He's not going to remember much. Oh, so so thank you all very very much i it's really beautiful to share this with you thank, you. thank you so much for all the hard work it just gives us a tiny peek into the work that you and warren have been doing um for a, you know a long time and pulling this amazing amazing story together we look forward to the documentary but thank you for taking the time yeah, to talk to us no um and uh and i think it, uh, larry do you have Say so. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thanks. I get. I, I just hope everybody has a, a wonderful, safe New Year, and we'll keep you posted. So. All right. Okay. I wish same for me. I hope everyone has a safe New Year and that we all have a better 2021. Yeah. And please sign up. Please sign up. Send me email or go to the websites, and I will put you on the mailing list. Okay, all right. Jerry, do you want to wrap up for the library minion? Thanks for coming. And uh, then we're working with Jane on other programming, uh, which will be on, on Zoom. I'll be working with Deborah. And we look forward to the day when we can do this face-to-face -face again. I wanna wish everybody a happy, healthy new year and see you on the other side.